July or presentation. This presentation today is a conversation between Dr. Francis McNabb and Dr. Stephen Kosky on the subject of positive ageing in body, mind and spirit, a subject that will assist in a more enjoyable life. And that's enough from me. And so it's over to Stephen. It's great to uh, have this opportunity to continue the conversation. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt once said, beautiful young people are accidents of nature, but beautiful old people are works of art. <laughs> you know, someone said we're in the midst of uh, a longevity revolution. That I read that we're living on average 34 years longer than our great grandparents did. You know, and the old metaphor of aging, you know, is an arch where you're born and you peak at midlife and then you slowly decline into decrepitude. <laughs> and, and this metaphor kind of views aging really quite honestly as a kind of pathology. And Francis, you've always encouraged and advocated a different view. You've always encouraged us to uh, reframe how we view aging, to have a different perspective, a more positive view. In fact, you wrote a book titled The Vital Years, <laughs> audaciously suggesting that the actual last three decades of our lives, what I might call the third act, that third act of our lives can actually be positive and vital, or as Eleanor Roosevelt said, possibly even a beautiful work of art. You know, it's interesting, we use the phrase growing older. Now, if we're actually growing older, it seems like the older part <laughs> takes care of itself. But how do we make sure we're growing? And to keep growing as we age um, seems to imply progress, learning, intentionality, reflection, wisdom. I read recently that 10% of how long and how well we live is actually dictated by our genetic makeup, our, our genes. But 90% of how, how long and how well we live is influenced by our lifestyle, our attitudes, our choices, whether or not we become stagnant or whether we're willing to, to keep growing, being vital. You know, I read in a remarkable article in the New York Times by Neil Selinger, a retired lawyer, who was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a, you know, terrible disease where, where the body deteriorates, but the mind and the spirit remain intact. And Selinger wrote an essay describing what was happening to him. And he wrote, as my muscles weak, weakened, my writing actually became stronger. As I slowly lost my speech, I gained my voice. As I diminished, I grew, I became wiser. As I lost so much, I actually started to find myself and discovered maybe for the first time in my life, what mattered most? You know, and I wanna be clear, I'm not trying to romanticize the tragedy and the trauma of ALS. I mean, it's horrible. But I thought Selinger actually beautifully embodied and described what's possible in the third act of our lives, the vital years. You know, as some things become weaker, we become stronger in other ways. As we diminish, 
in some ways, we might actually grow in other ways. As we experience loss, is it possible that we also gain something, find unexpected gifts? I mean, the Bible says, as what is outward is decaying, at the very same time, we can be inwardly renewed and strengthened. So Francis, I'm curious, what did you have in mind when you titled your book, The Vital Years? And as we grow older, <laughs> can we actually grow and become, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, beautiful works of art? Growing older can be growing into, did you use the word decrepitude? Growing, <laughs> going, growing into old age means growing old and becoming old. Or we grow old and we become, we discover a new era. We discover something new about ourselves, something new about the way we can live with each other, the way we can live in our relationships, we can just, it becomes a, a new era of discovery rather than a downward path of saying, oh, so this is how it is. How can we have a happy old age? Most of us talk about, if only I can, have, we hope to live into a happy old age, but what is a happy old age in fact? Was it in our experience to be happy in old age? A happy old age. So what do we want to have there? Hmm. Stephen, what do you say? You know, I love how you I love how you phrase that and frame that, that it can actually become a, a new era uh, of discovery. You know, and you know, and once uh, once a preacher, I guess always a preacher, so you want to do things in threes, right? Um, so, so I'm curious, I'm curious if this new era of discovery to be, to be positive, to have a positive aging, um, perhaps there's three G's, uh, the three G's that I want to suggest are, are grace, gratitude, and, um, generativity, you know, to, to be positive aging in mind, body, and spirit. And, and first to embrace positive aging in our bodies. You know, even in our bodies, a new era of discovery, as you put it. You know, I actually think we need to extend ourselves a little bit of grace. Plato said, when, when your physical eyesight declines, spiritual eyesight increases. And I'm curious, and I wonder if the spiritual eyesight of aging gracefully is being able to focus on what you can do and not be so obsessed with what you can no longer do. I mean, I have so many conversations with people where what they talk about isn't what they can do, but they're complaining about what they no longer are able to do. When I practice yoga, um, I practice yoga every day. I highly recommend uh, to everyone a daily practice of, of yoga or stretching, um, even chair yoga, if, if movement is a challenge. <laughs> and just recently, I was in a yoga class, and I was clearly the oldest in the class by, by I'm guessing, 30 years. And all of the other people in the class, uh, class around me I mean, they look like pretzels. They were twisting this way and, and, and that way. <laughs> and I have to confess, I looked like a Polish sausage <laughs> with no flexibility at all. Um, but I allowed my pride to get in the way. And there was a, a woman probably in her early 20s who was near me and I was trying to mimic her pose and her stretching. <laughs> I was grimacing. <laughs> and sweating and looking, looking like I was about ready to die. And the yoga teacher came over to me and said, Stephen, give yourself a little grace. 
Stop judging yourself for what you can't do. Instead of breathing judgment into your stretch, breathe compassion. And then she said, let yourself be where you are and celebrate what you can do. I just thought that was beautiful. I mean, I live near the mountains where there are mountain lakes and, and I absolutely love to go kayaking. And, and I have an autoimmune disease called ankylosing spondylitis, which attacks my joints. And it actually makes it really, really difficult for me to get in and out of the kayak. I, I actually can't do it on my own. It's, it's kind of comical. I, I tell my wife, if she videoed me getting in and out of a kayak, she could probably win a prize on Funniest Home Videos. Um, so I just used to stay home. I just would stay home because I didn't want to embarrass myself. And I was too ashamed to ask for help. But then I decided, you know, I'll just extend myself a little bit of grace. And I'll let my body be where it is. Instead of judging where I think it should be or being ashamed of, of what I can't do. So, so I need to ask for help to get the kayak in the water. I need to ask for help for somebody to help me actually get in the kayak and get out of the kayak. But once I'm in the kayak, paddling away with the snow-capped mountains reflecting on the water, I mean, there's nothing better. And that's possible because I just allowed myself a little grace. You know, the Bible says, the body is a temple. It doesn't say the young body, the strong body, the healthy body, the perfect body, the flexible body, the pain-free body is a temple. It says your body as it is, is a temple that deserves respect and kindness and grace. I mean, I used to view my ailments and my physical limitations as deficiencies or weaknesses, something to, something the beating to submit to submission to overcome to be ashamed of. Now I listen to my yoga teacher who says, "Be where you are. Give yourself a little grace. Breathe compassion and acceptance into that stretch." So Francis, what do you think about the importance of focusing on what we can do in extending grace to ourselves? I have used a very important word, acceptance. To be, to be able to accept where you are, to accept the realities of the situation. And then, so now here, this is where I am. This is what I am. Now, secondly, what are the possibilities? And so we've got two things here, to accept on the one hand and to look to the possibilities on the other. Acceptance and the possible. So now what is possible? Well, what do you think is helpful to, because a lot of people fight reality. They fight where they, you know, they fight against where they are. What do you think helps us to accept our realities so that we can then look at what's possible? Well, sometimes accepting the reality is forced upon us. We get up in the morning and we think, I'd like to run around the block. I'd like to run up the mountain and back. And you start, you know, you get a few meters and you think, I'd better stop and rest. So reality has its own way of instructing us. Hey, hey, this is the reality. Operate within these parameters. And then say, now what are the possibilities? What can I feel? What can I imagine? What can I think about within this within these stated realities so if we can do that 
We're looking at both the acceptance and the possible. I love that and, and sort of what that does to me invites kind of paying attention, uh, paying attention to, to where we are and allowing, us, allowing ourselves to be there and then to shift to what's possible, it seems, you know, it seems that we have to get to the, the next G, I think. <laughs> so we accept the realities with grace, but then to get to what's possible, I think that comes with practicing gratitude. I think it's especially important to be grateful when there seems so very, very little to be grateful about. I actually call that, that fierce gratitude. Um, gratitude in the midst of adversity. And I, I actually think a grateful heart helps us accept our realities. I think a grateful heart is a, is a peaceful heart, is a loving heart. And when everything seems wrong, when everything is a challenge or difficult, that I think is when it's important to celebrate what's right. That when, when fear or depression or despair kind of threatened to occupy every nook and cranny of our mind and, and our hearts, I think that's when we need to somehow be intentional. You talked about it in terms of of what then are the possibilities? And I think that's about being intentional of, of where can we find joy? Where can we see beauty? Where is there goodness? Uh, I mean, I love this quote by a singer, Michael Franti, who said, we don't laugh, dance, sing, or play to escape the realities of life. We laugh, dance, sing, play, appreciate beauty to keep life from escaping us. And I think when we can keep life from escaping us, we face the realities of life, the painful realities of life differently. I mean, I love the poem by Mary Oliver that she kind of abruptly calls, when death comes. And she writes, when it's over, I want to say, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I've made of my life something particular something real. <laughs> I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up having merely visited this world. So to, to shift from accepting realities to then focus on what's possible, Francis, what do you think the role gratitude plays in that? Gratitude is, of course, very important to all of us to be able to say, thanks. Here I am, thanks. Thanks for that and thanks for the, what's ahead of me. So it's, gratitude is looking at both the past, the present, and the future. It's a great, it embraces all three, the past, the present, and the future. What is now possible? I'm grateful that whatever has been, we say, yes, I'm grateful. But what now will be, I'm grateful that for that possibility. Hmm. So I look for the possibility as well. Yeah. If we can do that, we've got more than one, more than one way of living life. You can live it backwards by being grateful, we you live it forwards by being, seeing the possible and being grateful for the possible that's now waiting for us. I think I heard this quote first um, 
from you in the pulpit where you quoted Soren Kierkegaard, who said, uh, for all that has been, thanks. For all that is yet to be, yes. Um, so what, hel what, what helps you? Because um, some days it's hard. Some days it's hard to practice gratitude. Some days it's hard to look for the beauty. Some days it's, some days it's hard to say, say yes. Uh, what helps you uh, keep that, that positive frame of mind? We have to accept or admit this. There are times when it's very difficult. We have to admit that it's not all easy. But, but there is a but. It's a great word. Yes, but. So yes, but we have possibilities here. And when we look at the past, we say yes to that. And we say, look at the, the future. And we say yes to that. So it's a matter of, we're looking at an attitude, aren't we? The mind. The mind is a very powerful agent a very powerful friend to say, let the mind work for us. To say, help us to see that as we look at things in a different light, as we approach the realities, harsh as they may be, with a different, with a different slant, we can now live life differently. Yes. So we need to realize, realize as, and practice realizing that these possibilities are still there in front of us. It's interesting where I, I think, you know, there, there are days, um, I mean, I live with some degree of chronic pain. So there are days where it'd just be easy to sit at home and complain <laughs> and focus on what I can't do. And, uh, but if I can extend grace to myself and ask for help, get in that kayak, be on the still water. I mean, in these mountain lakes, the way the snow-capped mountains reflect upon the water and to breathe in a little bit of gratitude. I mean, it changes my outlook on everything. Um, but, yes, but, if your, mind is not, if your mind is not open to it, if your thoughts are not open to it. So we're going to insert this additional clause and say, how can we be open to realize that there are other possibilities, that there is a different attitude, that we can bring a different, a different perspective, that we can see things just a little differently. Yeah. A little different color to the, to the scene can change the whole scene. So there is, there is the reality of saying, put something else there. Hmm. Insert something else into the picture. Yeah. Lest we get stuck with what is over there, where we've been. That's where we've been. Now what's possible for where we might be yeah. in the future? I grew up in northern Minnesota, and uh, there are these dirt roads. I grew up in a, a mining area where they would mine these it's called taconite that gets converted to the steel. And these big trucks would take the taconite probably 40 miles to the shores of Lake Superior to be shipped, um, to be converted to steel. But these roads were dirt. And so there'd be snow and ice, and then the snow would melt and the dirt would be mud. And the, and the trucks would create these huge ruts in the road which would then freeze over. Because where I grew up in Minnesota, there's only two seasons, uh, winter and July, and that, that was kind of it. So the ruts would freeze over and there literally is a sign that says, choose your rut carefully. You're gonna be in it for the next 40 miles. <laughs> and I think some days, what I'm hearing you say is some days we can get into those ruts and, and how important it is to find ways, uh, new possibilities. It's just something new, new experiences. 
uh, new things to look at, new things. As you said at the very beginning, a new era of discovery. What's something new I, that I can discover today? Um, well, you know that you know that just as you can have the ruts in the road, you can remember that in Australia we have the dust of the road. That if you drive along the road, you can create a lot of dust. And that's that's good too. A different a different road to be on. As you create the dust, it lifts that up and says, look at all the dust I'm making of a new road. So we need to uh, extend a little grace to our bodies. We need to practice fierce gratitude um, with our minds. And I think the third and final G of positive aging is to have a generative spirit. I, mean, I think uh, apparently the two most dangerous days of a person's life are the day you're born because of the rate of infant mortality and, and the day you retire. That an astonishing number of people die of heart attacks in and around the day they retire. You know, maybe it's because they they lose a sense of purpose, they stop feeling useful. I mean, they stagnate. They no longer feel vital. So I often think, you know, to just kind of focus on yourself is to just get old. <laughs> to focus on what you can contribute to the lives of others, I think turns you into an elder. And the world could use a lot more elders, I think. I was reading one of the areas in the world where people live the longest uh, with a high degree of life satisfaction and well being, uh, what they call the blue zone. Um, I'm guessing you've been there, is Okinawa, Japan. And in Okinawa, um, there's no word for retirement. What I read anyway, that, that there's no, they don't have a word for it. But there is one word that kind of weaves its way through the entire lifespan. And that word is ikigai. And I probably butchering the, the pronunciation of that, but ikigai is roughly translated as the reason you wake up in the morning. And the idea is that everyone, everyone needs a reason. Everyone needs a, a purpose greater than themselves, greater than their ailments, some meaningful reason and purpose to get up in the morning. As I was reading about Okinawa, there was a, a woman I was reading about 102 years old, vital and alive and, and just, just really kind of uh, had this radiance about her while she was being interviewed. And she was asked, what is your ikigai? 102, what is your reason for waking up in the morning? And she said, my ikigai, is to hold my great, great, great granddaughter. When I'm holding her hands, it feels like I'm leaping into heaven. I just thought that was beautiful. You know, Father Richard Rohr said that we, um, we spend the first half of our lives building our container. And we need to spend the second half of our lives or the third act of our lives making sure our container is filled with the things that matter the most. I mean, Carl Jung said, one cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning may be of little importance in the evening. And what in the morning was true could very well by evening have become a lie. You know, I, 
I wonder if part of growing older, making sure the growing stays part of that, is the wisdom of knowing what matters most. And knowing that what matters most is this generativity, is the legacy of our lives. I mean, Joan Chittister, Sister Joan Chittister said, she actually said generativity defined as the act of giving ourselves to the needs of the rest of the world is the single most important function of old age. What do you think about, what's your response to that? What do you think about the role generativity plays in staying vital? Generativity. It's a, diff it's a difficult word for us. It's not a word we often, often use. It's to generate something that's valuable, I suppose, isn't it? To generate. Yeah. Generate goodwill. To generate good words. To generate good ideas. To generate good relationships. So generativity, by all means, let it generate goodness around us. Goodness between each other. If we're doing that, then old age becomes, becomes a different story. If old age is something we have to say, oh dear, I'm getting old. I've got my aches and pains to go take with me. Supposing we say, but what can I bring to my older years that are good, that are generating good thoughts, good relationships, good ideas, some goodness. We all have that possibility, I think. Even in our oldest years, we can say, well, there was some good memories, but there's some good things that we can anticipate. There are some good thoughts that we have about people, good people, and good, good things within myself. So it's important for us to listen as we grow older to ourselves, to the environment about us, and to what's ahead of us. Listen to what is there waiting for us. I think that's good. That's a good possibility. Well, I often think that, um, that every human being has a need to be both valued and valuable. And I'm wondering whether retirement is such a challenge for so many is because perhaps they no longer feel valuable. I mean, the ways, the ways that they were valued by others um, in some ways has ended. And that whether part of the challenge is is to find ways to be valuable. Um, and I'm wondering if one of the ways we can find ways to be valuable is to make sure we value others. That other, I don't think generativity has to be this big, huge, heroic acts of service. You know, maybe it's just the quality of our presence, as you were saying, um, how we choose to show up how we are present with others, um, whether we're just simply space takers or, or difference makers. What would you say if we have to value ourselves? You see, we sometimes put too, many, too much demand on ourselves, what we should be doing. The should is always a, a possibility, but it's also a problem or can be a problem. So rather say, well, this is where we are. Now let me, let me engage if I can and enjoy what I can and bring some enjoyment, allow some enjoyment to filter out to other people. So we're going to move in a sense to the ease of life, to enjoyment, to expectation, to the ease of, of how we can be different to each other. What do you say to that? Yeah, I think that's so, um, that's so important. Um, that, that really puts us full circle again, extending a little grace to ourselves. 
not putting so much pressure on ourselves, but even just the, the simple ways that we can be present, the simple ways. Um, I mean, I think I shared this before, there's a hospital, uh, Indiana University Hospital, um, has a sign as you walk in the, in the front door that says, take responsibility for the energy you bring into this building because we care about our patients and we care about our care teams. And so we want you to stop right now, take a deep breath and just check on your energy and make sure the energy you're bringing into our space adds value and doesn't detract. Now, can you imagine if that sign was on every building? Can you, can you imagine if that sign was at the front door of Parliament or in my case, the White House? Um, but just the simple things of um, if we're visiting family, if we're going next door, if we're going to the, if we're going to the local shop, what if we just simply took a second to think about the energy we bring to that space? And can we bring an energy that just might brighten someone's day? Um, I mean, it is 45 degrees, record heat wave in the Pacific Northwest right now. People are, are, are really stressed out. I went to uh, the local store to pick up some medication today and it was really warm in there. And I tried to imagine to myself, how awful it would be to be working to be working in that space with all of these people wondering why all of the air conditioners are sold out. Why aren't there any more fans? Why, why, why is the ice gone? And everybody was kind of angry. And I just took a second for the person I was dealing with. And, you know, just I just simply said, wow, I feel for you. It must be really hard to be here today. You know, I just you know, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. That didn't take a whole lot of effort on my part. And all of a sudden, a smile came across her face. She went from this, this kind of burdened person to a little, a little lighter. So I think generativity can be as simple as that. What, what do you think of that? I think it's very important to be open to the possibility. We often close ourselves in and say, Stand, keep your distance. Don't come too close. In fact, often people behave like that, as if, don't come too close, I'm dangerous. But change it a little bit and say, come closer, I'm okay, you're okay, we can be, we can be here in the same space and enjoy, enjoy the space. Can we do that? Because we'll all be different if we do, if we can pause and enjoy the moment, enjoy the space, enjoy being ourselves, the good self. We have a choice. Again and again, we have the choice. Will I be an angry, discontented person in this situation? Or will I be a more open person, a more enjoyable person? Yeah. Or a person that thinks that this is life as a gift. And if we can see hear the gift of it, perhaps we respond to it differently than thinking it's a, it's a burden. Because life, often we say it, life's a burden. Yeah. But let's change the, change the word. Say, how can we create a life that's a gift for myself and for you, for others? Yeah. There's someone by the name of Father Greg Boyle who started the something called Homeboy Industry which is the largest gang, you know, the uh, gang intervention and rehabilitation program in the world. He, every year they rehabilitate and give jobs to over 5,000 gang members in, in the Los Angeles area. And he said, uh, he said resilience, resilience emerges when you can return people to their unshakable goodness. He said, beneath the layers of shame and guilt and pain, everybody has unshakable goodness. 
And if you can somehow remind people of their own unshakable goodness, they can't help but reflect that goodness in the world. And I, I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Ah, but you've, you've mentioned a very powerful word in all of that as well. And that word was resilience. Yeah. I, I use it often to say, what, what, is, what does it mean to be resilient? It means to be able to start again. It means to have another try. Have another go at it. Resilience means to remember that although you've lost something, you can now try again. So resilience is a very, a very important and very powerful characteristic for every human being to realize they have that possibility. Resilience, to be resilient, even in an unresilient situation. <laughs> resilience, yeah. yeah. And I love what Father Boyle said. He suggested that part of that resilience is connected to recognizing that you are stronger than you think you are, um, which I think is, is helpful as well. Well, allow that strength to come to flow. Allow the strength right. that is basically present to all of us. Allow positive strength to flow. Where there are decisions to be made, you see, aren't there? Decisions to say, how will I behave in this situation? I could behave with anger, with disappointment, with regret, or I could take a different, a different road and change. I can make a decision to be different, to bring a different attitude, a different word, a different way of being in this whole situation. How can I do that? It's important, I think, that we realize we do have both possibilities. We have possibilities, the possibility of putting ourselves through the machine or the possibility of coming out of the machine and saying, I'm going to live differently because of the experience I've had and because of the experience that now awaits me in the future. Resilience is a great characteristic for us to cultivate, for us to le learn more about. You know, it sort of, uh, sort of reminds me, there's really no secret formula here um, for how to age well. There's no, there's no, no fail safe method to, to avoid the changes, the losses, the challenges, the natural consequences of growing older. But there's always the invitation to be resilient, to grow, to learn, to discover meaning, to use, to use the wisdom and gifts that we've acquired through our lives to give back to the world. You know, back to Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, I love that. Beautiful people, beautiful young people are accidents of nature. Beautiful old people are works of art. Works of art need to be worked on, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They need to work on our work of art. They do indeed. Um, but you yourself are a masterpiece. And, um, and you yourself are a gift to me and to so many. And I understand that, that I missed your birthday. And so as my gift, I want to offer you um, this blessing. It's actually called A Blessing for Growing Older by John O'Donoghue. May the light of your soul mind you. May all your worry and anxiousness about your age be transfigured. May you be given wisdom for the eyes of your soul to see this as a time of gracious harvesting. May you have the passion to heal what has hurt you and allow it to come close and become one with you. May you have great dignity and sense how free you are. And above all, may you be given the wonderful gift of meeting the eternal light 
that is within you. And may you be blessed. And may you find a wonderful love in yourself, for yourself, that you might continue to generously share that love with the world. As always, Francis, just an incredible gift and pleasure to, to talk with you and to be with you. So thank you. All, all good, good words, good relationships, good memories, and good possibilities for the future. And I thank you for that too. Yeah. What a marvelous conversation we have just had the pleasure of listening to. And I have the problem of trying to summarize it. So firstly, thank you, Francis, and thank you, Stephen, for, for such a, an enlightening and actually quite deep at times conversation. Things that I got from it, I love that the opening with the Eleanor Roosevelt quote, yeah, we are great, we are great masterpieces, all three of us. I like the little bit of statistics that you gave us, Stephen, that um, we have in fact added 50% to our, the average lifespan over the course of three generations. That I presume is thanks to medical advances, lifestyle changes and, and so forth. But in that time, we probably haven't changed our mindsets. So we must reverse the thinking that we decline into decrepitude. Maybe the body gets a bit weaker, but the mind can get a lot stronger. I love the three Gs. Uh, Francis would have had seven probably, <laughs> but the grace, gratitude and generativity, it is um, actually, I, I like the, the uh, prospect of imagining Stephen doing yoga and trying to match some <laughs> some lithe 20-year-old, <laughs> the mind boggles. But we learn from that to focus on what you can do and then move that on into the gratitude of remembering to laugh, dance, sing, etc to celebrate what we can do, despite our inability to do things that we used to. And then have a reason to wake up each day, Igaki. I probably didn't pronounce that anywhere nearly as well as Stephen did, but anyway, I had a go. So in summary, the three Gs, grace, focus on what you can do, gratitude, laugh, dance, and be grateful for what you have and what you can do. And generativity, do not stagnate, become an elder, help others even in some small way. Thank you all. That was a great conversation. We look forward to another one next month. Thank you and goodbye.